Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Risch. Light and Life Meditations on the Gospel and Epistles of John. By James Boyd. 10. John Chapter 6 and 7. Turn again to John's first epistle. In chapter 2 he says to the babes, ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. So in the Gospel, he shall guide you into all the truth, chap. 16. And in the epistle again, the unction which ye have received from him abides in you, and ye have not need that anyone should teach you, but as the same unction teaches you as to all things. And is true and is not a lie, and even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. And again, hereby we know that he abides in us. By the Spirit which he has given to us. And again, hereby we know that we abide in him and he in us. That he has given to us of his Spirit. The things of God can only be entered into and enjoyed by the power of the Spirit. Christianity is wholly spiritual, and only by the Holy Spirit of the living God can we touch even the fringe of it. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. In connection with this sixth chapter of the Gospel I turn to chapter 5 of the Epistle, where we have the three witness bearers and that to which their witness refers. This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that bears witness. For the Spirit is truth. The water and blood came out of the side of Christ dead upon the cross, John chapter 19 verses 34 to 35. The importance of this is manifest in the emphatic way in which the Apostle draws attention to it. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he says true, that he might believe. Nothing more concerning this comes to light in the Gospel. But here in the Epistle we have the blood and water called up in support of the testimony of God regarding the gift of eternal life. The Son of God has come by water and blood, that is, in the power of expiation and moral purification. And the Spirit is the witness by whom we are able to take in the import of the witness of the other two. He came down from Christ risen and glorified, the mighty witness that life is only in the Son of God for men, and to be in the believer as the spirit and power of that life. Giving the believer the consciousness that he has that life in present possession, while the infinite fountain of it resides in the Son. To him are added the testimony of the blood and water, which speak to us of the value of the death of Christ. The blood is that which expiates our sins, and the water that which cleanses morally. Here they are viewed as witness bearers, not as agents accomplishing the work, but bearing testimony to that which the death of Christ has accomplished. In that death our sins are gone, and in that same death the life of flesh is gone, and thus is gone in the condemnation of the cross the man that committed the sins. Our old man has been crucified with him, Romans chapter 6 verse 6, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. The Spirit, who is the power of that life, indwelling us gives us the consciousness that we partake of that life, and by His power whatever we may find within which may seem to contradict it. We know that our sins and the evil nature from which the sins sprang are both gone in the judgment of the cross, so that not only are our consciences cleared and set at rest, but we are clean every whit clean, John chapter 13 verse 10. Now if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which He has witnessed of His Son. The declaration of God regarding his gift of eternal life to the believer, is supported by three witnesses, and the witness of the three ten to one point, and that point is, that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son has not life. Life is only in the Son of God, and it is received by faith in him. He that believes on the Son of God, has the witness in himself. He has the Spirit who gives him the consciousness that he lives to God in that life that is in the Son. Living men have the consciousness that they are alive, and this is no less true of the one who lives in the life that is in the glorified Son of God. And these things are written to believers that they may know that they have eternal life. All this is utterly unacceptable to man as a child of Adam, who, though he may have some qualms of conscience, some sense of the need of forgiveness, and of being in happier relations with God, must have everything so adjusted that he will be left in his old relation both with God and men, the old affections undisturbed, and the distance between himself and God, in which he now is, maintained. To escape the penalties attached to his rebellion against the authority of God, and, if he must needs die, to be raised again and reinstated in the old conditions of life apart from the griefs and sorrows that now afflict him, this would be to him the highest conception of bliss. To have to do with God, to be brought near to Him, to have no joy but that which the knowledge of the love of God gave Him, to be in a pure and holy atmosphere. 
to be with the Christ whom man could not tolerate on earth, to see all the joys and pleasures in which he now delights pass from his vision as completely as though they never had been. Between this state of things and the hell of the damned he might hesitate to choose, for in his estimation the misery of either would be unbearable. From this time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. The life of flesh was everything to them, and a law that appealed to the flesh. Though it might curse them for their failure to fulfill its demands, was more acceptable than the words of eternal life that flowed from the lips of the incarnate Son of God. The glad tidings that he preached had no charm for the godless hearts. The seed had fallen upon the rock, the word had not been understood by them, and when it came home to their carnal hearts in its true character, setting before them the cross as the only way of salvation. The discovery was made that the word had never taken root, and therefore was it withered away. The glamour of his fame, and the power exhibited in his mighty works, had turned the volatile footsteps for a little after him, but when the test came their faith was seen to be only skin deep. They had never heard and learned of the Father, and his word had therefore no place in them. But whatever grief this may have been to his tender heart, his confidence in his Father remained unshaken. Already he had said, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and he desires no more than these. He will even now tell his remaining twelve that he has closed no door behind them, but has given them opportunity to go back to that which they had left to follow him. To them he says, will ye also go away? Peter, ever ready, answers for all, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet one of these twelve was a devil. In chapter 7, we see his unbelieving brethren would have him show himself to the world. Apart from his death and resurrection this could only be judgment to all, and nothing could have been saved out of the judgment to which all men were liable because of the guilty condition. If he gives his flesh for the life of the world then the time for his showing himself to the world had not come. His brethren, impatient in their unbelief with his humiliation and self-renunciation, desire him to bring to an end his path of comparative retirement. Man's time is always ready, but his time was not yet come. Therefore he says, I go not up yet unto this feast. Afterwards, when his brethren had gone up, he also went up, not openly, but as it were in secret. When he has received the kingdom he will show himself at the Feast of Tabernacles, but until then he does not publicly take a place at this feast. But he will in the meantime give something greater than this feast can afford. He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It is not only, as in chapter 6. He that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Here it is not only that one's own thirst is forever quenched, so that he thirsts no more. But he becomes a mighty channel of refreshing in this weary refidim. He makes the valley of Baca a well. The feast of tabernacles satisfied no human heart, for were they not under the oppression of the proud Roman, their throne and the glory trodden in the dust. He who showed himself well able to reinstate them in the glorious position which they occupied in the reign of David and of Solomon, yea, in a grandeur infinitely greater than was theirs during the reign of those two divinely anointed monarchs, was there in their midst despised and rejected, while the leaders of the people were plotting his murder. What an empty feast they were celebrating! And what a multitude of thirsty souls must have that day been gathered together in Jerusalem! With what sorrowful hearts those who came from distant places must have surveyed that city, destined to be the joy of the whole earth, now policed by the arrogant Roman soldiery, the throne of Jehovah overturned. An Edomite their crowned king, their temple left desolate, and their strongholds ruins. Well was it for those who could see in the desolation of Zion the just consequences of a long-continued course of insane rebellion against a righteous God, who had showed such unmerited favor to their thankless nation. What part could the rejected Messiah have in these empty festivities? The pride that lifted its presumptuous head in the hearts of the hypocritical leaders, the hellish hatred that surged there ready to break forth in his murder, and the changeful, vacillating, and conscienceless interest of the thoughtless crowd, were all well known to the lonely and heart-broken son of the Father. How empty, formal, and lifeless such a feast appeared to the gaze of heaven, and above all to the eye of God, for whose glory it was ostensibly held. How could he identify himself with such a state of things? If he went up to the feast it was not to participate in the festive joys of a people now on the brink of destruction. But in the knowledge that there were a few souls among them who were anxiously looking for something better than these things were calculated to furnish, and such cannot be neglected. Therefore, about the midst of the feast Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Jews are astonished at his ability to teach, and say, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? 
His answer is. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Here, as everywhere else, he keeps before his hearers the important fact that they had to do with God. He spoke the words of God, and the words he spoke became a test of their spiritual condition, as to whether they were in any measure disposed to hearken to God's voice, and to do the things he commanded. He says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak from myself. But after all, what were they but transgressors and murderers? And their inconsistent verdict against himself only proved themselves to be judges having evil thoughts. They condemned him for speaking a word that made a man every withhold on the Sabbath, and yet practiced circumcision on that day, that they might keep the law of Moses. Their lifeless ritual was of more importance to them than were judgment, mercy, and the love of God. But, as he tells them in the next chapter, they were of their father the devil, though their vain boast was that they had one father, even God. He spoke that which he had seen with his father, and they did that which they had seen with their father, they came out in his characteristics. He was a liar and a murderer, and so were they. Children bear the moral impress of the parent who has begotten them. The devil was the first liar, and he was a murderer from the beginning. In the first epistle of John we read, He that practices sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning, that is, from the beginning of sin, he originated sin, lying, and murder. The one born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In his practical life down here the one begotten of God does not practice sin, that is, he is not characterized by it, because viewed as begotten of God, apart from his mixed condition on earth. He cannot sin at all. A believer can sin, but is exhorted not to, but begotten of God, only takes in the work of God in his soul, and sin can never proceed from this. Like father, like son, must ever be true. But among those who were listening to his words there may have been thirsty souls, those who wanted something better than could be found in lifeless forms and ceremonies. For these he has all that would meet the need, and more than the need, of their souls. The Spirit of God was the gift that was to be bestowed upon the believer. But for this the work of redemption must needs be accomplished in his cross sin must receive its judgment, and it must be judged in flesh, where it had its seat. No other than himself could take the place of the sin-bearer, for the victim must be without blemish and without spot. Sin, sins, and the flesh in which sin reigned, have received the judgment in his holy flesh, and the flesh forms no part of the believer in his relationship with God. It is still in him, and shall be in him as long as he is in a mortal body, but he is not in it, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwells in him. The holy oil was not to be poured on man's flesh, Exodus chapter 30 verses 31 to 32, but on the blood, Leviticus chapter 14 verses 14 to 17. When the gospel of our salvation is believed we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, for all true believers are in the value of the blood of Christ before God. The Spirit is given from a glorified Christ. He was given in answer to the intercession of Christ. He is the Spirit of truth. He testifies of Christ. He takes of Christ's and shows his things to us. He is the Spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In John's first epistle he is said to be the one by whom we know that Christ abideth in us. He is also one of the three witnesses given in support of the testimony of God, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Everything connected with true Christianity is in his power.